gentlemen. The April 22nd, 2011 meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council Ad Hoc Subcommittee on the General Plan Update will now come to order. Are there any comments from members of the public on items not on today's agenda? Seeing none, we will begin with a staff presentation on the agenda. Go forth. Um, thank you, Chair, members of the Ad Hoc Committee and members of the public. Um, we have a number of items today. Uh, we thought we, if they wanted to, the ad hoc committee wanted to discuss at all the summary direction that we got from the council on Tuesday, it's certainly an opportunity to do that. Um, otherwise, we can jump right in and talk about uh, Measure E, the non-residential uh, square footage uh, issue, followed by the noise policies, second unit policies, and the a uh, comprehensive review of the draft plan remaining issues. And uh, what we thought on that last item, if we, uh, if and when we get to that, we can perhaps start that with a review of uh, Councilwoman uh, Self's uh, checklist. And I do have a couple of copies of that. We might, might be a good starting point for that item. Okay. So. Mr. Ledbetter, I, I think in the interest of brevity, we'll skip the summary direction people can watch the city council meeting to find out what that was. Uh, I have been informed by my fellow committee members that uh, they have other commitments that are going to entail their leaving here by five minutes to four. So let's stick with the main items. We may or may not get to the comprehensive review of the draft. Um, I want to spend as much time as we need to on these other very important items. And I also want to let people know that we'll have a a public comment section for each of the agenda items as we go along. Okay. Mr. Ledbetter, would you like to start with a discussion of growth yes. limits? Yeah, actually, I'll, I think I'll turn that over to Ms. Weiss here for that first item. Thank you. As you all know, the sunset of Charter Section 1508 and the growth management program and ordinance that goes with that is one of the main reasons that we embarked on the Plan Santa Barbara process. And so growth management with respect to non-residential development is a key part of the general plan and the city's development process. So there have been um, a number of prior discussions on this topic, but because it is so central and you're really uh, discussing all the key issues, um, it was uh, a good idea to have a particular review of this um, topic as well. So the last time that the council did look at this question was in November uh, last year as we were moving towards an adoption phase. And there was a straw vote taken by the city council and it was five to two to support 1.35 million net new non-residential square feet that would be developed over the next 20 year period. And that program has certain components to it. Um, this approach with the plan Santa Barbara um, is similar, very similar to the existing, what we, people refer to as Measure E, but it does have some um, consideration for differences as well. So starting off first, uh, the prior Measure E program had uh, a cap of 3 million square feet, and it was divided into certain categories. And one of the um, important decisions uh, back then, as has been now, is uh, what to include in the cap and what is excluded from the cap, and then how do you break down the different categories. So I'm going to review the bullets that we have on your agenda that help explain that. So the square footage would be distributed among a small addition category, a vacant land category, and a community benefit category. Um, the amounts that are shown here um, on your agenda, 500,000 for small addition, 300,000 for vacant and then community benefit at 550,000. Those are new new category allocations different from the prior because we're dealing with 1.35 million instead of um, the three. Um, however, um, the way this is working out at least to date, again, these, these are preliminary, they could be adjusted. Um, the vacant category is similar to what we have had um, in the last 20 years, and there's actually probably a good idea behind that because there was a vacant land inventory done, and there was assumption, and then this standard has been in place for quite some time, which is that on a vacant piece of land, your starting point is what's called a 
0.25 FAR. So if you have a 10,000 square foot vacant commercial site, your starting point is 2,500 square feet of building area to start. And we haven't really had any challenge with respect to, to that category. The small addition does reflect a smaller amount that could be allocated per parcel, again, because 1.35 is, is less than 3 million. And then the community benefit category is different, and that will look at the policy languages. Um, what's happened in the current Measure E was we had community priority, and then we had a separate category called economic development. And what we're proposing in Plan Santa Barbara is to have one discretionary category combined. Okay, consistent with the current ordinance, this is second bullet, minor additions, which are projects of less than 1,000 square feet, would be exempt. That has served the community well in these past 20 years to not have a lot of processing or bureaucracy. People can come in and get a 500 square foot addition to their store. Um, that doesn't require any special findings or anything like that for additions of less than 1,000 square feet. Excuse me, Ms. Weiss, is this just commercial we're talking here? Non-residential, yes. Non-residential, okay, thank you. And we use that more general term of non-residential because some is like commercial retail, industrial, a variety of uses, yes. The 1.35 million would exempt pending and approved and government buildings. This was a policy point. Um, again, all of these are <laughs> for direction by council. In that prior discussion with the city council, um, there was question about whether or not to include the pending and approved projects. Um, and on that point, I think the, the consideration was, let's have them as a separate category, and once, once that square footage goes away, it simply goes away. What has happened in other, another way to, to treat that is that if the, it was included within a cap and projects expired, you could make a decision if you wanted to use that square footage in, in, a, in a future scenario. But my sense of, well, the council direction last time was, let's just keep that separate, and once they either are approved, they're approved, or if they expire and go away, then that square footage is gone. On the government buildings, um, the discussion on that point was that um, there are a lot of governmental institutions in our community, and the city is the only one that is regulated under this program. So if the school district wants to build, a new maintenance facility, they don't get Measure E square footage. MTD doesn't get Measure E square footage. The county doesn't. And really, these are primary governmental functions. We know we have the city of Santa Barbara government functions to run. So the idea was is that that really could be treated separately from this commercial or non-residential pot. So um, we've, we have used a fair amount of the community priority square footage. Well, not a fair amount, but from time to time, city projects like an office expansion at El Estero. You know, that needed square footage. Um, and so the, the thinking is let's simplify that and have reserve the square footage for non-public functions. Okay, the next bullet is about implementing the general plan. <clears throat> These policies for growth management, um, the council will also be considering as a really key first next step for implementation will be the development plan ordinance and findings and a resolution that will go along to implement this section. Again, that's modeled after our current program. It's really essential to have the general plan and zoning consistent so we, we know what to do with the development review process. And then the resolution provides additional direction on uh, process and findings. How will you find a project of community priority? That's what's in the resolution now. So we envisioned something similar working with the city attorney on those things. These were the four uh, initial questions we thought that you should touch on. Does the subcommittee concur with the council direction of the 1.35 million net square, new square footage as the growth to be managed in the next 20 years? Um, and I do want to take a moment to say net new square footage. Another thing that has not been included in this cap is rebuilding. So if someone has a commercial building of 5,000 square feet and they demolish it and they build back five or less, it, it's not considered coming out of this because the reuse of existing square footage was determined to be an important part of keeping an, a vital economy um, and giving, again, property owners uh, reasonable use of their land if, if they are, have already made these improvements. So that's one question. Um, question two, does the subcommittee agree with the amount of non-residential square footage in each category? 
And again, I can explain a little rationale in each category if you like. Um, okay. Um, and we'll refer to the attachments for those. Question three is, is more discussion and direction needed regarding the definition of community benefit land uses? And um, Council Member South has posed questions regarding those um, categories, so I think we'll want to look at those. And then the last one, is more direction desirable regarding the findings for approval for development plan, including overriding impact to traffic? Um, this is an important policy issue that um, really should be considered as part of your whole, your whole weighing of what the land use and intensity should be in the future. But it's actually uh, possible to defer the, the final decision on that until you're in adopting the ordinance. But, but we really haven't discussed very much about the limitations on new non-residential development if there are impacts. And given the findings of the environmental impact report, um, which is different than what the council had before them in 1989. Um, I think we may, we may want to have some additional discussion. That could get kind of technical and involved, but I, I think today might be a good time to talk about that. So that's okay. my overview. Okay. Um, first, any questions from committee members? Yes. Mr. White? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of... of uh, one clarification, the 1,000 square feet addition, that's one time per structure, isn't that, as, as I recall, right? Yes, that's correct. This is all cumulative. So let's say, it's not really one time. Let's say you come in and you build 200 square feet on your store yeah, one year. a total of 1,000. <clears throat> yes. Once you go over 1,000, you're now into the small addition the category, category where development plan findings right. are required. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then um, do refresh our memory on the quantities that are pending and approved. Okay. Where's B? Okay. Uh, it is one of our attachments. Um, it's called attachment three, I think. No. Attachment three was a list we prepared um, at the time of the council discussion in November. So we haven't... Um, well, just what's the total quantity? 19, 19, yes, sorry. We did add those page numbers. Okay, and this... Okay, 20. 19 was a list that we prepared at that time, and it was about 80,000 approved and 272,000 pending. So page 23 then? And then page 23 is a table where we put the um, pending and approve as 353,000. Okay. And you. that number, this was one of the reasons to cons possibly consider it a part as well, was that number keeps changing. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and then, and then the, the, another category which has not been quantified is the TEDR, right? Um, yes, we have, um, we do keep track of every building permit and, and track the what happens with this non-residential square footage, adding, subtracting, demo, demolition. So we had an estimate of the amount of um, demolished square footage that could be a potential for TEDR, and it was about 500,000. Um, but our actual experience in the TEDR process has been about, what, 80? 60,000. 60, so although certainly every time someone tears something down, there's that potential. But the reality of what we've seen is a small fraction of yeah. the overall. But it doesn't have a, a, a shelf life. It does, it it's stays there. I mean, if somebody 20 years later wanted to, does well, the Measure E stuff continues forward indefinitely, right? Well, um, maybe not. This mm -hmm. question came up at the Planning Commission, and there is a policy within Plan Santa Barbara to possibly reevaluate the TEDR ordinance. So it, this is an ordinance of the council to say, you can transfer demolished square footage from one property to another. Um, that ordinance of council could be amended at some time in the future. And um, Mr. Wiley and I, I think had this discussion with, I can't remember who, Planning Commissioner Council in the past, was that if at some time in the future we're going to change the rules on someone, we would, not someone, the, the community, <laughs> um, we would probably look to decide what gets grandfathered in mm -hmm. under 
old rules and then have you can always create a new rule to move forward certainly mm -hmm. so the that is at the discretion <coughs> of the council to at any point consider a change to the TEDR ordinance thank you mm -hmm. thank you mr. chair sure mr. Hopkins? Uh, Ms. Lee, you were going to um, fill us in or remind us a little bit about the uh, ratios. I think that's what I was trying to talk about. Okay. Um, first, on page five, um, LG number two, this is what staff believes would be appropriate within the land use policy document to go ahead and include whatever category amounts is are decided upon. Um, this is, like I say, one of the key issues, and, and it should be a clear policy that we move forward from. So um, I have another handout where I guess it's page 29 um, that compares the allocations that were done under the 3 million square feet to the proposed 1.35. So that's page 29. So again, um, back in the late uh, 18 not 18, <laughs> 1989, um, the, uh, the amount of pending and approved was actually quite substantial um, at that time. About 700,000 square feet were pending, and about 900,000 were um, possibly, uh, you know, were approved and could possibly move forward. Um, 600,000 for small additions. What that is, if you divide 600,000 by... Um, 20, you get 30,000. And so each year we allocate 30,000 square feet under the small addition category. That's the current procedure. And further, small additions are defined currently in the ordinance as three, up to 3,000 square feet per parcel. <clears throat> oh, I was wrong about vacant. Oh, no, originally vacant land was about, was 500,000, but approximately 200,000 of vacant land I'm, B is the fact checker, okay? So if we need to, and you let me know if I'm off on anything. Um, uh, we've used approximately 200,000 of the 500,000. Economic development was not an original category. Um, I'll explain that in just a minute. And then community priority was at 300,000. Economic development was created by the desire, it was a kind of a rough economic time. In the, in the early 90s. And the idea was um, uh, this is a fairly pretty limiting development program. And as square footage was not being built or used, um, the, the charter and the ordinance did anticipate that the council could reallocate. And so it was actually a charter amendment went forward to create the economic development category from unused square footage. But it was all within, because it was unused, it did not, it does not exceed the three million cap. It was just a reallocation. Okay, so the next box below is what we're now proposing. Um, and the estimation of pending and approved is somewhere around um, 350 thousand square feet um, and dropping really probably more than it than adding um, and then government buildings we, we don't have an estimate on that small additions of 500,000 if you divide that by 20 I think you get um, 2,500 2, and then thousand. our idea was that each property would get 2,500 would become the new small addition, the smaller allocation. The vacant land at 300,000 because of what we have remaining, we think that could still have the 0.25 FAR. And then community benefit, um, you know, just doing the math to make it all add up to 1.35, that's an allocation of um, 500,000, which should be, could very well be sufficient. Um, again, looking back at the development trends of what has been allocated and approved in the past, we have an attachment on that as well. Does this, would this be um, consistent with our last 20 year record? I guess it's one way of saying it. I think that's sort of what we're saying here, right? Yeah, in, in many respects it is. If, if you take out the pending and approved, which was different then, and you take it out now, um, we said we'll hold vacant similar. Small addition gets smaller, and economic development doesn't keep growing, so it is more, a little more restrictive. Um, and, and economic and community is combined in 550,000. So it's it's a reduction, but not necessarily a significant reduction. It's when a reduction consistent with our track record. Correct. Okay. Yeah. 
And the airport is not included in this. That's pending, correct? Right. The airport is an example of where um, that facility, they made use of the economic development category because um, it would have completely depleted, just as Cottage Hospital would have depleted the community priority. Um, uh, those projects use the economic development square footage. And B, which table, which attachment shows some of our <clears throat> Let's look. Back on page she says 15. page 14, 15, okay. Oh, right. Here's the list of what has been allocated community priority. And then I don't know if we did a list of economic development as well. No, we didn't. Oh, okay. Although some of those, such as Cottage and Airport, were a combination, dual of uh, economic and community development. Our community priority. Over the course of the Measure E program, the economic development category has been up to a million coming in and out of that. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to <coughs> feel, get a feel for why we were picking these numbers. I was sure we weren't throwing darts at the board, and you've explained it, so thank you. Uh, just one quick question. Assuming that we had the categories... Uh, that we're proposing now, then the airport construction would have fallen under government buildings. Is that true? Yes, we have we have yet to really def define that, um, and I would think we'd want it to be for governmental purposes. Like, so for example, in the waterfront area, if if one of the general commercial buildings was being rebuilt that houses restaurants and retail, um, just in our current Last 20 years, the way we managed this so carefully, I would think that would not be under government buildings. I would Just agree. because the building is owned by the city doesn't really mean it's serving right. a government function. Sure. So I think our idea behind that was utilities, government functions, things like that. So when you say utilities, then you're talking about the water department, for instance, or wastewater. Right. And, and a utility. If you have a room at, in El Estero that's filled with equipment, already under the ordinance, that doesn't count as square footage because square footage for a regional utility is, is not counted. But again, we've been very strict with this program. When they wanted to build an office addition, we counted that as square footage. Mm. So our thought in this program would be the office addition would also be under the category of government building. Right. We'd be a little less controlling as yes. we have been in the last 20 years. Okay. But are you suggesting then that the, the airport, even though it's an enterprise fund, that airport construction would not come under the government? No, I, I think that it, it would. Okay. It's, it's run by the government. It's, um, uh, it's true you could have a private airport, but in Santa Barbara we don't. Right. Um, and these are good questions that we'll... I keep looking to the back of the room because I know there's someone there that'll end up helping define this. Um, so, uh, okay, yeah, very good, uh -huh. thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to open it up now to public comment on this topic only. So, if anyone has anything to say, please step up to the lectern and identify yourself and and speak. Good afternoon, council members, uh, senior staff. Um, I am basically uh, going to say what uh, Citizens Planning Association... Paul, would you please identify yourself? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Paul Hernadi, uh, speaking for the Citizens Planning Association, based on previous uh, statements and letters. The current proposal to add uh, 1,350,000 square feet of new commercial development plus an essentially unknown amount of development in several exempt categories would undermine the attempts to diminish the city's jobs housing imbalance. This addition would also add to traffic congestion much more than the same square footage would add as residential development. This is especially true if the tens of thousands of non-residential square feet already approved for transfer of existing development rights will also be considered exempt from the uh, total square foot limit. As stated before, 
CPA recommends that a lesser amount of new commercial square footage be permitted. Whenever possible, buildings needed for new commercial enterprises should replace or adaptively reuse rather than supplement existing commercial structures. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good afternoon, Kellum DeForest. I would like to know when does Measure E sunset? If it sunsets at all, but uh, it would be nice to know what the date we're aiming for. On community benefit land usage, I thought Measure E was designed to discourage the overbuilding of Santa Barbara. Uh, since government usage is exempt, why should any other usage be usages be exempt? They're going to they're going to be buildings and could overpower the ambience of Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good afternoon. I'm Sheila Lodge. Uh, as a planning commissioner, I voted for the planning commission recommendation, which was for a million square feet. And I still think that given the issues with um, the jobs housing imbalance, the more that we can do to reduce the increase in, in new jobs, um, given our housing situation, I think the better off we are. Ms. Lutz, just a yes. quick question. Refresh my memory. Did the Planning Commission, when they, in that million square feet, was that including the pending and approved? And I meant to look that up, and I forgot. I hope staff knows. I, that yes, it was. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it really was considerably more restrictive than sure. was proposed. Okay. Thank you. Any more comments? Okay, I'll close public comment on this item. And entertain comments from my fellow subcommittee members. Perhaps if I any. should answer. Oh, please do, yes, Just yes. answer the one question sure. at least, because um, I think that's a good frame of reference. The charter section has sunsetted. Uh, that was December 31st, 2010. So it's not in the charter anymore. However, um, it is still in our general plan, just like we were looking at here. There's similar language in the current adopted general plan. And there is an ordinance implementing that um, in the zoning ordinance. And that has a sunset, um, I think it was to be three, I think it's 2013. Anybody? Yeah, right. 2013. And the idea behind that is we're really hoping that much before that, this replacement ordinance would be in place. But okay. that allowed enough time to get a revised ordinance done. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Chair, just, uh, one clarification uh, from the, the uh, Planning Commission's recommendation for 1 million square feet. Uh, projects that are pending and approved as of time of ordinance adoption, government buildings and sphere uh, area annexations are considered separately and in addition to the net new non-residential developments established above. Okay. So it's more similar to okay. what's being proposed here. Okay. And Thank you. I mean, Mr. Sure. I.e., a million plus... Yes. The roughly 353 plus government is open ended, right? Okay, we have a. Hmm. Mr. Ledbetter, what was the page reference on that? Uh, that's on page 92. It's LG2, second paragraph down. I think it's in the spiral book, though. I, I, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Oh. I just. Okay. I, I'm a little concerned about referencing this document because this was the. Um, this was presented to the Planning Commission. Ah, And okay. I think, right, we went, we put this out right. as the proposed final and we had Planning Commission hearings. And my under recollection was, we didn't know what to write in there, you know, and, and in fact we had blanks at some points and um, I'm not sure that that's, cons that the Planning Commission went with as drafted. Yeah. Is that correct, Pete? 
Planning Commission has 1.35 exempting the pending approved and government. Mm, no. 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 No.
able to uh, find appropriate housing within close proximity and they're facing commuting. All these various reasons, that's why people talk about the jobs housing balance because we would like to be in balance, whatever that ratio means for um, our community um, where uh, the impacts of commuting are lessened or, or found reasonable um, because that will remain a fact in the jobs housing balance for, for our community. I think, it, again, based on the nature of what activities go on here in Santa Barbara that are so broad serving the region. Do we have any real numbers that are We do have some numbers, and I would need to run upstairs and um, pull the EIR. I didn't think to bring that. Um, but it does are have a really good discussion. Numbers or, or estimated numbers, do you recall? Uh, they're measured numbers. They're based on certain certain um, demographic information in terms of uh, number of jobs, which is fluid again, um, and uh, number of housing units, and then type of housing units. We did the jobs housing ratio, looking at how many affordable housing units we have compared to some of the other. Um, local jurisdictions as well. So we really analyzed this this uh, question from a couple different angles in a s special section in the EIR. We really have never established what our desired balance would be, correct? Th not to my knowledge, yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. White? Well, um, a couple of additional pieces. I'm just going to, I'm recalling uh, the conversation, the, the planning Commission conversation over the years talking about there being some 20 to 30,000 commuters coming into town to work uh, on a daily basis as being a concern. So that was kind of one of those, I'll just use a super broad number, but, but a big number uh, of folks coming into town. That's, um, and therefore an, an, an issue of concern. Going back to Measure E, to the formation of Measure E um, 25 years ago. Um, Another element that's uh, important in this number is the, the findings that were required in Measure E and presumably would, uh, uh, would move forward with its now successor is the finding that, uh, that the traffic impacts are uh, not going to tip an intersection to over a level of service C to to worsen below a service of level on service level C, is that am I correct in that? Well, um, I think the language it doesn't specify that it says um, have a significant traffic impact. Have a significant and, impact, and the and other that's finding, defined in the thresholds. Right. The other finding that's related is within Measure E and the development ordinance now till um, is not having a significant impact on the south coast affordable housing stock. Oh, okay. So um, I, I, I'm sorry to wedge in on one of your comments, but I just remembered another thing. From a policy perspective, and this is what the Planning Commission recommendation is trying to do, and what was the approach in 1989-90, um, was recognizing the existing situation is to a certain degree what it is, but wanting not to worsen it, wanting that the next increment of growth, which was a, a term used, at least that the next increment in growth would be in balance. Therefore, a, a reduction in commercial development activity and encouragement of housing. In 1989, when Measure E and, and the general plan went forward, that was the philosophy. We've held down commercial, and we're really going to encourage housing, even though it really wasn't quantified that it was in balance. That, that was the concept. And in fact, in the EIR, they did analyze that. With these next all these different scenarios we had, the low growth, the high growth, you know, would they be in and of themselves a balanced package? Um, so I'll refresh myself on that if, if, okay. I, if I have more to add on that. Okay, yes. very good. So comments then on this. Um, I know that when this was in front of council last year, um, I think that uh, the, our, Mr. Francisco had advocated for the this this the the 1.35 million plus the uh, the new and pending in addition square feet that's that's how we got to this number and I had understood that to be sort of I look at that as part of the package of um, you know the non-residential going forward with the residential so I supported it at the time 
in in the hope that we we're going to come up with a, a pack a compromise package and i i'm still looking for um, a compromise to on, on the package to to move forward um, i like the 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 planning commission uh proposal i think the one sort of wild card which i could i could be more supportive of is to take the government out and let that float uh free um, I don't expect there to be a lot of government development over the next 20 years. So, but it just it, it feels to me like okay, let's set that let's set that aside. But that we would tighten down and uh, and really basically maintain the, the, that uh, that planning commission number um, feels best to me. Um, and as I say, I even when I was thinking about loosening. My earlier support for uh, the, the, the the PC restrictive position to accommodate uh, Mr. Francisco's position, I had in the back of my mind the traffic impact uh, findings that are a big safety valve for this. It's going to be it, it would be very hard to build over a million square feet of, of commercial development in this region uh, and meet those criteria of traffic impacts. So that's a safety valve going forward. How, how, you know, how could you envision it happening? It would, it would be very difficult to occur. So that's basically my, my foundation on the non-residential okay. development. Okay, very good. Mr. Hotchkiss? Um, I th oh, I did have one question. Um, I have my intuitive idea, but does someone want to suggest why the transfer of existing development right square footage is not being used, I'm assuming because it would cost something as opposed to just getting going through and getting permission to use square footage that's in the pool. Is that is that it? I think that's one one reason. It is a private negotiated arrangement between two property owners. Um, I think Another reason is there just isn't a, a site and a project very often that really needs to be of larger scale than what has has worked in Santa Barbara, and one of those one of the reasons behind that is that people have really enjoyed this mixed use and have felt that residential development is of greater value than commercial in, in many of the commercial areas. So if people had an existing commercial space, they would demolish that, not even necessarily replace it all, and the trend really was to be adding residential. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably been the biggest that's factor. The and then at the time when that category was created, it was also this idea that we may get a, um, a little mini South Silicon Beach or, or something, you know, that there was going to be an explosion of, right. of, of commercial development. <clears throat> and another reason why it hasn't really been used that much is, again, those developments can't result in significant traffic impacts. And just it's very difficult to get a project of any great scale in Santa Barbara given land costs, location, development standards, and so forth. If I may, Mr. Chair. The, the projects of scale that came forward are Sandman, which has 60,000 square feet of commercial on it now and is proposing to put in nine or anyway, right. some number that sure. this is way smaller. Another one is this, um, where's, where Caro's was, what was that? Radio Square. Radio Square, again, similar, lots of commercial there now and proposing to come in with quite a bit of residential and uh, a net reduction in commercial square right. footage. But where it has helped is, like, say, for example, I, I don't know all the details, but my understanding is that the Ellen Conto uh, used transfer development rights. And um, if, if you have a large site that already has a lot of commercial square footage, 3,000 square feet might not be the number to make your project work. And so if you need to go on the market to purchase another 2,000, 3,000 or whatever, mm -hmm. um, that amount is. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure, go ahead. Would you, would you describe what we're proposing here, the 1.35, et cetera, um, as encouraging or discouraging commercial growth? 
I think, um, as you said yourself, it's pretty close to continuing the existing policy. And what that existing policy has meant um, is it, it was a significant reduction in and of itself. The Measure E decision back in 1989 was a significant reduction of the build-out potential of non-residential for our community. That was a really big decision. I think that this decision is more or less to continue to carry something similar to that forward. Um, and if we're talking somewhere between a million to a million and a half, I'm going to still feel that that's generally consistent. Um, staff has had some concerns about the Planning Commission recommendation, so every time this item was discussed, we would bring that up. And these concerns are when you get down, I, we agree philosophically, but when we got down to trying to allocate into these categories, that's where it started to feel a little too restrictive. But in the bigger sense of your question, I think it's a continuation. Um, and for example, the vacant land, you know, that number would need to come down. The small additions wouldn't be 2,500, they might be 1,500 square feet. And how much square footage is in the pool for community benefit? All of those on that page 29, that bottom table, you have to add a line now that says, pending and approved at our estimated 350,000. Um, so then these other categories have to come down some to make, to make it work. But it's, in the big picture, it's not a whole lot different than the, the philosophy is continuation of a limited non-residential growth for our community. I might just add to that as well that just kind of in a, ba a macro picture here, you think about Measure E was 3 million square feet over a 20-year period. We used up about half of that, right. 1.5 over a 20-year period, and that's kind of what we're looking at here. We're looking at between 1.3 and 1.5 over the next 20 years. So it's roughly the, about the same. But the big decision was implementing a growth management program, which is pretty landmark for a general plan. I mean, most general plans don't even have growth management programs, and that's what Ms. Weiss was referring to, you know, that reduced our capacity, you know, from uh, 100 million or something like that down to, to three, you know. So that was the big change. And so now it's like, okay, well, this system has been working pretty well for us for 20 years. How can we fine tune this, adjust it, and make it work better? That's that's kind of where, where we're at with this. Right. right, and in light of current reality, if we didn't even have a limit, nothing might happen anyway. Well, that's true. Yeah. That remains to be seen. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and Mr. Chair? Mr. Uh, White. Two things. One is the, that the, if, if miracles occurred or worst case occurred, depending on your perspective, and this space was consumed, the TEDR is at a, at a hidden half million uh, square feet uh, starts to come to the fore as a, as a, as a commodity. I, I can tell you, having been involved in some of those in the past, um, the, 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 the folks that own that, that, that square footage know, know that they, they have something that has potential value, so and unless there's a policy to, to get rid of that. So that's a, um, another safety valve in the area of, uh, of potential square footage. Um, when this was before council before we had, it was 5-2 in favor of the policy that's out, outlined here of the 1.35 million, I'm, and partly because I supported that policy obviously and also because um, I'm happy with anything and that's part of Plan Santa Barbara that gets five or more votes. Um, I tend to think that we should go along with this. I feel as if the, and my, my rationale originally was that it did appear to me that this is essentially a continuation of the policy already in place. When, when Measure E was adopted back in 89, uh, three million square feet were allocated for potential development. As we saw, we used far less than that. Um, in, my, in my view, uh, obviously, things could change. We could be in a radically different environment 10 years from now, but in my view, the, the trend that we've been seeing over the past 20 years, if anything, is a slowing uh, both of economic activity and actually negative population growth in this area. So going forward with, with for the next 20 years with less than half of what was originally uh, allocated in 89, I think really what this is, in a, 
in, a, in its essence, it's really a continuation of Measure E with no change whatsoever. It's as if Measure E were extended for another 20 years. That's, that's how I look at it. And we could talk about the, the allocations to each category, uh, but overall, over a 40-year period, I think this is essentially what we, or what the city envisioned back in 89. Um, I believe that it's a good idea to keep the government category separate and exempt since every other government entity in the world can do whatever they want uh, within city limits. Um, and I think that is the, I think that's the extent of my, my comments on that. Um, so I would, I would like to recommend that the, that the subcommittee uh, concur with the existing council resolution. I realize that councils changed slightly since we adopted that. Um, but I think my view is that this really does continue uh, what was begun in 89. This really is, is not a change except in how we're categorizing where the square footage goes. And Mr. White, you raise a good point about the TEDR. That may come, uh, depending on what happens, that might become more valuable sometime in the future. And I think at some point we do need to have a, uh, have a discussion about is there sunsetting on TEDR square footage because it does introduce an element of instability into this, into this kind of planning. Well, I concur with your recommendation. If it counts as a second, so be it. Okay. And um, as I say, for me, it's uh, I've used the term ecosystem. It's uh, it's it's part of a package. Uh, I can live with it. Um, I I think my my preference would be the uh, the PC recommendation. I except for we pull pulling out the government, and I mm -hmm. think that's a good um, uh, step. Um, but you're saying you're you're pulling out. Pending approved and government, is, which was the right, re repetition. Exactly. So I think if my ideal at this point would be the the, the PC recommendation without the without the government. So okay. uh, provided we can come to uh, agreement on other agreement on things. everything else, then uh, I, I could work with that. Okay, so I think we could call that eighty-five percent concurrence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, Moving on to the next item, or next did you have any? The next question is really just a detail of um, <coughs> on page 29. You know how we showed the categories. If you had any comment on that, again, what's shown on page 29 is consistent with what Councilman Francisco right. and Hotchkiss are saying. Depending which way the ultimate vote goes, we would do our best to allocate it. You know, consistent with this approach. Do you have any concern? And I. We're, I think that's what we were assuming. Okay. And I also yeah. think that uh, the I like the idea that this this category of community benefit has been combined with the economic development category because it's been difficult to tell. And if you look back at the history of what's been approved under under community priority, it's difficult to tell sometimes what exactly is which. And putting them together seems fine to me. Chair, Mr. White. I would say if I were to have any concern, it would be the, the, the bump down from 3,000 to 2,500 of the small additions. Uh, I, I'm concerned about the cost and the time that goes into, uh, again, a, um, a business owner putting on a, a project of that size. So that's, mm. if I have a hesitation, it's, um, it's there, um, the 3,000 square foot. There was, there was a time, trust me, when people stood in line on New Year's Day after New Year's, uh, waiting to get started on their on their small additions, uh, getting in line, mm -hmm. but um, uh, that was uh, so. I, I that, that's an area where I, I have uh, some concerns. Okay, I, mean, I like a, I like the three thousand square feet, and um, we're going down to twenty five hundred. And then that's an interesting point, and I think worth discussing at another time when we have some more. Maybe we could get some information on exactly how many, or is that in here already, about exactly how many small additions have been approved? Yeah, we have all that, okay. and I think it is one of the attachments shows okay. how much has been used. In e it's a dark um, PowerPoint slide. Okay. Um, and so if we main try to maintain 3,000 3, per parcel, then it has to come out from somewhere else, either vacant land or community um, benefit. Well, or, or, I mean, I'm just picturing as we sit here watching 3,000 square foot applications not occur for a couple of years, that that would head us toward 
3,000 square feet. Uh, I don't know whether there'd be any way to hedge the bets. Pour it back in uh, such that the, the reservoir allows us to, to, to get up, to go up to 3,000 square feet. That happens for a few years and we're there. Yeah. Well, it is, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, but I think we should move on to the next agenda item since we have limited time. Okay. I, I just a little, I'm not so concerned about talking about the definition of community benefit land uses because I think we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, we really haven't had a very good discussion of these findings, and okay. they are a pretty important um, okay. element enough. of this uh, whole program. So in um, the city did a, uh, a negative declaration for the adoption of the prior um, plan and said it was speculative. We didn't know each project would be reviewed on its own, and it wasn't determined whether or not there would be significant um, traffic impacts. Um, when Measure E was, uh, well, Measure E was voted on, but when the general plan and the ordinance went in. And so we set the standard for each project that came in under this program that it could not be approved if it had significant traffic impacts or, or contributed to a housing concern um, unless it was out appointed the category community priority. So if your community priority you could have overriding considerations. If you're a small addition of 3,000 square feet near a freeway interchange, you might not be able to move forward. So what we have done in the last 20 years is we've looked at every project that came through. And depending on the traffic circumstances at that time, Milpas, before the roundabout, you, and you've heard Council Member House talk about this because he had his, off, his business on the east side at that time. Before the roundabout was improved, Milpas had to wait because we couldn't approve projects there. And then, then the roundabout and other changes kind of freed up that opportunity. Um, Upper State Street has been impacted at different times, but depending on what's going on on the freeway as well. And so to some degree, that's worked out. You know, development has been stalled while there's impacts, and then there's opportunities at other times. But... Um, it has really been on a case-by-case -case review, whereas now with this EIR, we have a long-term look at 20 years, and considering background growth, growth under these different scenarios, we have anticipated that there could be, I think it's like 13 or so more intersections that are either become impacted or become more impacted under the current city standard. And so this question really what do we say about who can move forward and when, now knowing the long-term view? Do we just continue with this finding and say, no overriding unless your community priority? Or when the council approves this plan, uh, you're gonna have to make overriding considerations. So once you've made the overriding considerations for the whole big long-term picture, you might want to think about how you want to make those findings in the future, for which projects and which ones not. It is at your discretion. But that's why I said this hasn't really been introduced. It's a big topic. Maybe we would suffice today just at least to, to let me get it out so that you're thinking about it. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't think we have a firm recommendation yet. We're still in the stage where we would be wanting to pose questions and options to the council on this and um, have felt that it'd be great to have policy direction at this plan level, but given so many moving pieces and on, on this, you know, maybe it does just become one of the first implementing big decisions that needs to be made. Um, again, particularly given how we're still grappling with all the moving pieces that we've already put on the table. Um, but we have been concerned that the level of understanding of this point hasn't really been, there hasn't been elevated to even um, primary you know, thoughts about what we should do. So we're, we're anxious to be able to move on to that point mm -hmm. to present these for discussion with the council. And, and I appreciate that. Um, my, my view is that this is to some extent an implementation issue that we, I believe that at the general plan level, we certainly want to say that we need to make findings, uh, but I don't think that we want to specify 
in detail exactly what those findings would be. It seems to me that's a that's a discussion we could give a general outline, perhaps. But I think coming up with those with the exact terms is something that probably needs the input of the full council, and will we'll take some meetings. I would actually I would describe it as the as Council Member White did because this is the been our position and I'm not even sure that it would change. So really, the current findings are you can't approve these new non-residential with impacts, and we just want consideration of that. We're sure. not even suggesting that it change or how it change. So that is that is our status quo. Okay. Well, yeah. well, please put that on the agenda for the meeting after adoption. <laughs> No. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, yeah, I mean, I, of course, have been, as a planning commissioner uh, before, have been thinking about this and worrying about it all the way along, um, and also having my wife's family having been, uh, uh, having been living in the Pasadena area. The issue about the redevelopment of Pasadena is kind of one of the models that of, of smart growth uh, that um, people look to as well how do, how do you re revitalize an area how do you how do you um, encourage development going forward in an area where the tide of traffic is going up it's not even our it, some of it's our own generated and and some of it is not but as mr. Dayton has indicated there's the the we have the future, unless something really drastic happens, is going to produce a whole bunch of intersections that are clogged up. And do you prevent development, good development, in certain situations from occurring? Because you have an intersection, you have a policy that says that if you've got a clogged up intersection, you can't develop. So that's, that's the conversation that we need to have at, uh, and uh, because we don't want to throw out the good uh, because we must have perfect, uh, and that's obviously it's going to be a difficult call to make. But that's that's what uh, concerns me, and I think it will uh, govern or, or bend the conversation on uh, commercial development and as we go forward. Sure, thank you. Okay, next item. So outdoor noise, um, and these issues are really about, uh, they focus on new residential uses and citing those. And the reason that this issue has been brought up really through the general plan, plan process is because um, it's been somewhat problematic citing residential uses in commercial mixed use areas and even in some of the single family areas where they border on a, an environment that has a higher noise level than what's permitted in the zoning ordinance. And so the idea here was uh, this today the state as well as the federal uh, noise levels, they all um, uh, they all set those noise levels at 65 dBA as an acceptable outdoor uh, level of noise for new residential development. Not what's on the ground, but when you're uh, developing it, uh, that is acceptable. And that's under the um, uh, understanding that uh, for your interior noise levels, you can get um, a, a reduction to 45 uh, decibels. And that's something in today's uh, technology is easily attainable with double pane windows, insulation, that kind of thing. So, I mean, originally, um, you know, uh, 30 years ago, uh, it was set at 60 because it was difficult to attain that level of noise reduction indoors. So, um, so, so really, the idea here is to um, bring our standards up to what state and federal standards already are for new residential development, again, particularly in the commercial and uh, for mixed-use types of development, and in some cases uh, for single-family as well. 
So now when this uh, issue came before the, uh, the planning commission, there was a lot of discussion about it and there was some discomfort with the idea that um, if you're upping the standard to 65, somehow that's going to uh, allow for more noise in the single family areas. And there's kind of a disconnect there because that's not really what it means. It means that, and we, and we have some recent examples. There was a home over on Allen Road just recently that um, was right on the border there with the creek. And, you know, they're in a single family area where it's 60 uh, dBA. And yet they're close to, to uh, Las Positas, so they have some of the roadway noise there, which is, you know, the primary source of noise in our city are the roadways. And so they were, you know, in a, their environment was about 65. So they, they wanted to do an addition in their, uh, on their house. And uh, lo and behold, in order to do that addition, they were going to have to meet these standards to, for their outdoor areas to reduce the noise levels to 60. And so that was a very expensive um, endeavor to uh, build these sound walls and that kind of things. And, and so it's really a, a matter of um, uh, implementation in terms of uh, new development that you're seeing uh, these uh, uh, these guidelines here. So what I would suggest is maybe let me turn to page 31, and this is what's being proposed. And um, I'll read off here for... Um, uh, possible implementation actions to be considered. Noise levels. Update the general plan noise element land use compatibility guidelines, including establishing 65 CNEL as the appropriate maximum outdoor noise level for residential uses in commercial and multifamily while maintaining 60 in single families. This ambient noise level uh, guideline for residential building construction shall assume indoor noise levels meet building codes for, for 45. Now, uh, what's, what we're recommending, that this is basically the, the Planning Commission recommendation. So now what we're recommending as staff is, and it's kind of buried here, but um, if you turn to uh, page uh, 34 uh, to address this issue of uh, some of these single-family uses that are uh, being affected by uh, noises adjacent to them, down underlined in the one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph, fifth paragraph down and underlined the last sentence here. It says, um, uh, "Let's see." Um, well, I'll read the whole paragraph here. An additional policy language change could be considered to address this issue to provide that residential projects in single-family areas already subject to higher than 60 dBA average ambient noise levels would also utilize the updated 65 DN, uh, dBA uh, guideline. So in quotes here it says, uh, this would be the policy, while maintaining 60 CNEL in single-family zones, except for single-family areas where areas subject to these higher ambient levels for which 65 CNEL guideline would also be established. So that would be something staff would recommend as an amendment uh, to this first issue. That, and then there's two issues. Then there's a second issue about use permits and that kind of thing, and we can talk about that next. I just wanted to further expand on this Allen Road example. Um, that project requires a coastal development permit because of its location. We looked at it. Um, I'm trying to think, Samarkand, you know, near the Las Positas area. It's not in the coastal zone. Someone may be in a noisy environment there where their exterior is 68 or something, and they want to do a bedroom addition. No one will ask them for a noise study. They will go to the building counter and get a room addition because there's not a discretionary review. So this really goes to a fairness question in terms of standards of review because Many people in the community, if the single family home makes a, an addition that's non discretionary, not coastal, not a single family board, near Las Positas State, De La Vina, wherever, they can, they can add to their home and they don't have to do a noise study and figure out adding sound walls on their own property. But this property owner on Allen Road did. And so, um, just want you to know it's a real practical constraint on property owners in our community when it's, it's beyond their control that they happen to live in a 
an, on a noisier street and two blocks in, their neighbor can do the addition and, and so, they can't. So, Ms. Weiss, in that case, the one you're describing on Allen Road, is it because it was within the coastal zone that triggered something about having to... It triggered environmental review and a policy review. Okay. Yes. And why was, was the... Was the 65 decibel standard, is that something from the, the, of state law or? Yes and no. I mean, the state laws and building and health and safety codes do have standards about um, noise, as well as the federal government, like um, John mentioned. But each community, typically in your noise element as part of your general plan, has what we're referring to as um, compatibility guidelines. So we're saying that this noise environment is usually appropriate. But when you do environmental review, you take your general plan guideline, and now it becomes an environmental standard. And so that's what's happened. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, John, would the, uh, as written suggestions here, have prevented the Allen Road difficulties? Yes, that's the point. That's that, the point. Yeah, that, exactly. that they could have avoided that. Okay. Yeah. Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we have a this uh, victim on Allen Road, um, and we see the ministerial permits in the inland area able to move forward uh, with uh, uh, a bedroom addition. Um, I would. I'm thinking that this applies to, like, let's say, a lot split occurring. What, what happens, to, that would be an area where in the inland area, the 60 dB versus 65 would apply. The discretionary permits would, would kick in. And this exemption would apply to those lot splits as well, right? Yes. So, okay, welcome. I, luckily, I just, you know, I, I feel fortunate that my, I'm slop, that sloppy with my language. But uh, uh, anyway... Th there's the difference. I mean, I, I, I sure see the point of the of the victim on Allen Road, and yet on the other side of that, and it may be a little bit of what Planning Commission was was trying to head toward is, you know, let's just say lot splits occurring. Um, you know, that's where we want to have things uh, quieter, uh, higher quality, and of course it's a place where that, uh, as those have known me work on on PC, that's a time when those sound walls could go in at. Uh, uh, with reasonable cost. So that's that's an area where uh, I'm supportive of the Allen Road victim, and uh, but I'm uh, when, I'm wondering if there's a way to get there uh, for existing development. I mean, yeah. And then another element is I'm recalling us have mods, and maybe we're also just trying to you know mods are a pain. As well, I see Betty doesn't like mods, and I don't blame her. We don't. Nobody likes. Mods. You love mods. <laughs> I, lo I see Betty loves mods, um, but uh, anyway. Full Employment Act. We're trying. We're trying to. Yeah, exactly. We're trying to. Min we're trying to min keep that stuff as, as streamlined as possible, and we and we certainly want to be fair. So, just one clarification in terms of just trying. Maybe this is a, a different way to think about it. Um, who you're protecting from what? So when you do your lot split. You know, and and it's in 60 uh, dBA. Um, your the idea is you want to protect the new homeowner that's coming in from any extraneous noises. And if it's you know a existing subdivision and it's quiet, uh, it's not an issue. You know, and they're not going to generate. You're not protecting. You're not putting these big sound walls in to protect the neighbors. From the screaming kids of the new the new person that buys the lot, you know, that that's not the that's not the purpose of it. Yeah, the the purpose is to protect the new homeowner coming in from the extraneous uh, sounds. And so you might argue, okay, well the neighbor might have noisy kids and then they're going to impact them. But so you, you, maybe it's helpful to think about um, who the these uh, noise. Um, who the noise standards are set up to protect, you know, 
And in the case of the neighbors, and we do want to protect the neighbors in the single-family areas, and oftentimes where the, where the issue is, is is like with Ealings Park. There was a huge issue of, you know, of, gosh, this intensification use on the south side. It's really going to impact the neighbors. And, yeah, that, and that speaks to the other point here of, of having use permits. So any non-residential type uses in a, or in or adjacent to a neighborhood, yeah, they need a use permit, and they need noise studies, and they need to keep it down, you know, to, to stay. And then you're protecting those new neighbors. But in the case of the lot split in the existing neighborhood, think about who you're protecting from who, you know what you're I mean? Protecting the new owner, the new house yeah. from 65 dB. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. But if it's the, if all the surrounding neighbors, I mean, if it's 60, you know. It's not screaming kids. I mean, this is the, yeah. the, this is the empty lot on Las Positas. Bingo. Uh, yeah. That there's being subdivided into two pieces. You would be you would. Right. And that's that would, a discretionary. Would, exactly, and, and that would be the same as the Allen Road situation. But, that, but no, what I think that's, Council that's Member exactly White is saying point. is yeah. there's a bit of a difference between an existing homeowner wanting to add, right, and and a decision to allow new development of one lot into three, for example. Right. We've just introduced two new homes in a noisy area. Right. Maybe that's not our policy. Maybe we don't want that. So personally, I think that still is the policy. We're just saying that noise threshold should be 65 instead of 60. And the reason is if you look at the, the noise contour maps and you look at the um, what other communities find acceptable and what you can achieve indoors, saying that 60 is appropriate. We'll still run into some location, perhaps, where that point of we don't want additional residential development in this noisy of an area, and that's a completely, even just a lot split. Um, but the 65 solves the fairness of the uneven discretionary for existing homeowners, and it allows reasonable develop future development we think if it's a 65 dBA environment, because we don't have any, re, we've done many studies on this. This does not result in health impacts. I mean, from an, since we take this policy and we make it our environmental threshold, it really doesn't hold water as an environmental threshold, because it doesn't result in, a signif in, in an impairment of people's health at 65. So we're just trying to be a little more modern. We're not trying to expose people and new development to higher unacceptable levels. You still have a threshold and it would just go up 5 dBA. But it, it, this is not a well understood issue. I know that Council Member Hotchkiss has asked about it at prior meetings too and it just seems to get flipped. Right. The public hears 65 and freaks out. I was wondering, uh, Mr. Chair, if, if it might somewhere in the goals we might say something along the lines that it is the aim of the city to keep or reduce noise levels through in, in, in um, residential areas, just as a policy statement. Mm. And because that's really what we're talking about, you know, Allen Road was not changing anything. We're, in, in that case, we're just trying to make it easier for, for somebody to actually put an addition on their house and, and not put them through a gazillion hoops. So all of this, I think what I hear from Ms. Weiss and uh, Mr. Ledbetter is all aimed towards making life easier for the residential owner. And that part hasn't been understood. So if there's a policy statement at the top that we're trying to keep noise levels where they are or even less, that's the aim of the city. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Thank you. And, and to me, Mr. Chair, I, I see there being a, 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 I, I completely agree the, with the Allen Road uh, example. It actually increases the amount of area which is going to be quieter because you're going to have another room that's um, sheltered from, from an another space, sheltered from noise. And on the other side of that, I, uh, and I, I just asked staff to give some consideration, and, and hopefully I'd be able to get support on that, that new subdivisions in that area, you could, that would be a good opportunity for a noise, a sound wall to be built or the, the glass uh, partition at, at that spot to, to protect the yard from noise. Uh, if a new house, if a, if a person is actually splitting a lot, and, and of course we're talking about, there's probably a grand total of about four of them left in the city somewhere in some obscure uh, spot. What? Oh, I see. I, I, oh, well, I it, it does shaking. come up. If, if you're in agreement that for the commercial zones, 
No, 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 yeah. We could change it to 65. You're yeah. just talking yeah. about single family? That's exactly okay, right. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, you can look on um, uh, this map and see where this could come up. So, um, and as we're talking page 35 here? Yes. Yes. Um, anywhere where you see the, if you look in the legend, the red box with the lighter color in the middle or the red box with the orange in the middle. Um, like Foothill, State Street. Red outline. Um, Page 34. Las these Pacitas. are the noise. These are no, uh, Las Positas. So those are adjoining residential uh, single family areas. And um, again, I, I'm sorry to just be so practical about it, but because the SFDB looks at um, second story homes in this Samarkand area, um, one neighbor builds a one-story addition. They don't get asked to do the noise study. The neighbor next door, if they want to do two-story, which we'd like to see the design of it. Our purpose is to see that it fits in the neighborhood, not to apply a different noise standard to them. But when they go to SFDB, we have to do an environmental review, and they will have a different standard applied. So it's not even just coastal zone. It's because SFDB is um, discretionary, too. Mm -hmm. So it could pop up. Beyond lot splits is all I'm saying. Is there any way we could streamline? A mod, any modification requires discretionary review. Because that trigger for discretionary review is pretty vast for us, this comes up a lot. Okay. More, than, more than lot splits, I just okay. wanted to mention. Okay. And, and, I, and I'm sorry. It, I'm it, it, seem, it seems to me, do we have any other questions? Because we're going well into comment land here. If not, oh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask the public if they have comments on this before we go further. So, okay, very good. Uh, I'd like to open it to public comment on this topic. Anyone who would like to speak, please come to the lectern, identify yourself, and state your case. I'm Judy Arias, and I have two questions to ask. Is the mic on? Oh, it's on. It's got a green light. Oh, okay. Uh, the first question, I'd like to determine what Mr. Ledbecker Becker said about the uh, events, um, particularly at Ealings Park, where there has been great concern about the very large amounts of noise that occur. This would be covered under a special permit, as you said, and there would be control of the noise. Mr. Ledbetter? Do you want to answer that? Sure, would you please? Okay. Um, on page 31, we've proposed an additional policy beyond our current um, standards. Um, and it says neighborhood noise. To further general plan policies for maintaining quiet and high quality neighborhoods, require more detailed noise assessments for proposed special conditional and institutional uses with activities and events that may cause noise effects to residential neighborhoods. We did an environmental impact report for Ealings Park and we used the existing standard of 60 dBA. And because, if you understand these noise readings, it's an average over 24 hours and all these things, they were able to show that they weren't going to exceed that. But where we want to get to is to have a different kind of standard for these types of uses. And in the environmental impact report, we did a study of just, instead of just, we did the study that averaged it out, and then we did an additional study, and the park is doing additional study now, of all the peaks and, and how bad it can be for a four-hour period when something's really going on there. And under the conditional use permit, the Planning Commission may find, okay, there's not a significant impact from a CEQA standpoint because your average is 24 hours, but this noise information is unacceptable. It's not compatible. So they have, through the CUP, the ability to still deny or, or modify a project. Um, what we'd like to do, and we're updating the environmental guidelines, is try to get this in more as a standard. <coughs> you know, yes, I think the discretion is there with the CUP, but it'd be good going in to know that more, more definitely. So we have this additional policy recommended now that would have further implementation, um, either amending CUP language and findings, um, and we are looking to amend um, the environmental uh, standards right now and so we're we want to add something about that 
Okay. Um, my next question is the 60 uh, dB versus the 65 dB. Um, is this the 60 determined over a 24 hour average? So again, you can have massive peaks and right. they average out over 24 right. hours to but non significant. The, right, exactly. Which is, is a serious concern. The other thing I think you should be aware of is that it is from 60 to 65 is an exponential growth, which is not just a gentle slope. It's up. Mm -hmm. up. So I really think that you need to look very carefully at this increase in, of noise, <clears throat> particularly the averaging and the fact that it's exponential. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon again. I am a different person without my jacket. Um, the, uh, uh, my, uh, I am Paul Hernadi and I speak for the Citizens Planning Association. I would like to clarify CPA's position concerning the proposed raising of the city's noise standard. Uh, what is quoted in today's agenda, attachment to B, is correct. In May 2008, CPA supported the change to 65 decibels for the average outdoor residential noise level. That support was, however, voiced in the context of three recommendations, the last of which read, and this was also quoted in another appendix of the agenda, but less prominently, and this, this, um, this, this uh, recommendation read, amend the zoning ordinance to prohibit any new residential unit where the noise level of the required outdoor living space would exceed 65 uh, decibels. Noise pollution is widely recognized uh, as an important health issue. Therefore, we have always been concerned that Santa Barbara fails to raise <coughs> the stringency of noise standards from the authority of mere guidelines to the authority of zoning requirements. This means that double panned windows built in air conditioning or mechanical ventilation would remain acceptable mitigation measures to ensure that the indoor noise levels can stay below the federal and state requirements of 45 decibel. In relatively recent comments about individual development projects, we have repeatedly argued against uh, against making it almost necessary to keep windows closed. Clearly, the ability in Santa Barbara to keep windows open most of the year can significantly reduce heating and cooling costs and avoid the wasteful use of energy. Closing windows within noise-impacted areas of the city are not as sustainable a solution as increasing setback requirements would be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandi. Any other comments? Okay, I'll close public comment. All right, subcommittee members. Comments? Mr. White. So basically, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd, I feel like there's a situation, the single family residence is, is one where you, you want to allow someone to go forward with a, adding a room on, um, and not have to do a noise study. Um, however, if someone, I, I just, I, I am, I know that if I just, we, we put it back to staff to come up with the 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 gist in the form of technical language that it'll happen. That, however, lot the the tiny amount of land that is subdividable uh, out there. Uh, I'm sure that could be covered where those new lots, new, and, I, and I think Mr. Hernardi's comment uh, alluded to it of new residential units, um, I, I think the outdoor space ought to meet the 60 dB and, and hold to the Planning Commission standard. Thank you. Mr. Hotchkiss? Um, could you explain that again, uh, Wendy? I'm not sure I understood what you said. Okay. Saying. Um, you have a house that's that's in a substand. It's in it's 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 outdoor noise area is 65 dB or more. Right. They want to add on a a, a room. Right. Now at this at, at this current juncture, they have to do a noise study of their outdoor area, and then I, I presume either get a mod if they're over 60 dB. I'm, I'm seeing a. Sorry, there's no modification for over noise. 
standard. Mm. No, the, a there modification is no is, mod. No, okay. it's not a modification issue. It's we use that general plan noise standard to determine <coughs> if the project's consistent with the general plan and consistent with general plan policies to protect the environment. And so what ends up happening is, is it causes a concern for approval of the project if you have to find it consistent with the general plan. And then it also causes a problem of whether or not we can say the project's categorically exempt from CEQA because it's exceeding a, a resource policy. There's no mod for noise. But it's still going to be more expensive. Oh, it's just, it, it well, just, you, you just have to jump way up. Yeah, you have to, if you have the ability to propose a pex, plexiglass thing around your patio or if you wanted to add on to your kitchen, and your kitchen's near the front of the house, you might think, well, am I going to instead add to the back of the house and move the kitchen to the back of the house? I mean, there's sometimes it's difficult, very difficult to come up with that noise mitigating thing. And I, I imagine Mr. Hernadi and CPA are referring to, I don't know how often we've done this because I think it's really ridiculous to record a condition on the property or something that says, you know, the windows have to be closed. And somehow that mitigates the situation and it, it, it's just... So, so continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> but there's okay. no mod. I want you to know it's, it's a finding a consistency. Well, or, yeah, I mean, yeah. then it gets worse. If there's no mod, then it's even... The, but, you're but you're anyway. diving into even deeper uh, uh, land of, 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 of uh, permits and, and exemptions and uh, stuff. And so, as I'm saying, I, f I feel like the single-family residence that's, that's in the non-conforming spot right. ought to be able to... Uh, just the example that, that, that <coughs> staff's been know. using. Ought, ought to be able to go forward. I do too. But if there were, a, let's next door to that, if there was a, a, a piece of property that could be subdivided into multiple houses, it's got a house on it now and it has enough land for two more houses that would be non conforming, that, the, the, the 60 dB standard ought to apply to the outdoor spaces in that non conforming area. And they would be required to put up sound walls or uh, what, build a house in one place and the, and, the, and the open space, the designated open space would be protected so that it would be, uh, the design of the project would create 60 dB uh, open spaces, sound uh, noise studies would be done, and all of that would be part of the project uh, package that would move forward because the owners being bestowed being bestowed with a discretionary approval and added value and it's economically feasible in the project. So. May I reply? We, yeah. of course. Um, oh, I think uh, we can do what Council Member White is asking though. The policy could, if your policy interest is that existing development has an opportunity to uh, improve when it's in a, an area of up to 65 dBA, um, but we write in the policy, new development, inten intensification of development, such as a development plan or condominiums where you're adding new units, is subject to a different standard. I, I think we could do something like that. I mean, I don't have it all figured out right now, and there might be an issue, but if that was your general direction for us to explore that, we, we could Just, do just that. philosophically, I would say that it should be a, 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 an even playing field, and I wouldn't want to... Necessarily, it's not a game changer, but I wouldn't want to apply different standards to two neighbors right next to each other. That's, I mean, just philosophically. But I don't think it's that big a deal. Okay. Um, let's see. May I address? Please. Um, well, I like what you're proposing, and because I do think it makes life easier for folks, uh, and I do uh, suggest that covering phrase that so the public better understands what our intent is. Um, and that's where I stand on that. So thank you very much. Um, I think that I think Mr. Hotchkiss makes an excellent suggestion here in clarifying that the goal of our noise policy uh, always should be to keep noise levels at worst at their current level and hopefully reduce them. Um, I think it's and I think that's an excellent suggestion because we want to make it clear to people that this the suggestion here of of changing the standard from 60 to 65 is not because we want more noise it's to allow reasonable development in places that are already over in some cases well over the 60 dB standard um, 
and uh, I agree with Mr. Hotchkiss, and, and again, for me, this is not a live or die thing, but Mr. White, I'd just like, uh, I'd just like you to consider that, um, in a sense, this is an affordable housing issue. Uh, given the choice, uh, given what people may be able to afford, they may their starter home may be on Las Positas Road. That's quite possible, and that's not desirable because of the traffic and the noise. Um, but if the interior le living situation can be made uh, healthy, that's a decision that people may be forced to make. Um, and that's why I would I would agree with Mr. Hotchkiss that I don't think we should treat treat the case differently where in one case an existing homeowner wants to add a bedroom and we say that's fine even though it's 68 decibels on Las Positas. Uh, in another case somebody wants to split their lot and allow the possibility that some other person comes along and buys a house knowing full well they're buying a house on Las Positas Road and it's not going to be quiet. Um, but again that's not that's not a live or die issue for me but I and I would hope, Mr. Chair, that we, we it's clear, I, I, I'm clear that we all agree that existing development, that the, the, the addition on Allen Road example, we all agree uh, it needs to be changed to allow 65 dB. So let's right. at least make sure yeah. that we are you know, yeah. moving forward with that. Exactly. And uh, I, I still feel that... Um, from what I've seen in in the in the subdivision world, that there's you, that, I, I mean, virtually every time the ingenuity of the developer steps forward and they find ways to uh, configure development to meet those uh, uh, standards. I'm co I'm confident, and as I say, first of all, there's going to be so few of them out there that it's uh, uh, it, it's not going to get. It, it's not like gonna, it's going to stop some major uh, trend in in, uh, in activity. Mm -hmm. The major trend is rehabilitation and and uh, minor additions right. to existing development. That's the thing that we want to make to streamline and make as reasonable <coughs> as possible. So um, on that front, I think we're of accord. And uh, and the other, I'm I'm going to still kind of. I think that we can we can hold a high standard to the subdivider, um, but I, I also think that the operative area is the single the existing residents. Well, staff, do you Got want it. to interpret that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, just a quick summary here. Then, uh, as we look at this, uh, you know, the the policy here on. Um, uh, on page 31, so there would be agreement with these both these policies here, with the um, understanding uh, that uh, the language that um, staff's recommending on page 34, the underlying, except for single-family areas subject to higher noise ambient levels, for which 65 uh, guideline would be established, we would differentiate there between existing neighborhoods, so they all. Uh, had this enjoyed the same rights for an addition, but for new development in those two or three uh, places where we could subdivide in a single family area, they would have to adhere to the 60 DBA. Does that capture it? That's at least, I think we've got the full conversation here, and then we can just see what council do, does with it. Right. Well, I'd like to make a recommendation, and, and overall, I could, you know, I could live with that. Okay, great. Okay. So does that... I, that's a unanimous recommendation. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, moving on then to item number four, second unit policies. Um, <laughs> we have actually gone over this a number of times at the Planning Commission and also at the Council trying to clarify uh, exactly where the, the city's position is vis-a-vis -vis state law and then what is being proposed and what is not being proposed. And perhaps it's really uh, uh, critical here to understand what's not being proposed. So let me back up and first just start out with the state law. And, you know, the state law, they've amended uh, the second unit uh, provisions four times uh, since 1982 to help encourage and promote uh, the construction of second units, a second unit in a single family uh, zone. And uh, basically what they've done is they've taken uh, 
the discretionary uh, ability from a local jurisdiction uh, to disapprove a second unit, if you will. Now, what they do allow you to do, though, is to have conditions that you have to meet in order to um, get that second unit built. And we have um, traditionally had very high standards for those conditions to be met in order to build a second unit. And so what that has resulted in is just really just a handful of second units. But it has, uh, depending on your perspective, it's also protected the single-family neighborhoods from um, a lot of additional development. So uh, that's kind of um, a background on the, on the state law. Now, um, the other part of it is, as part of uh, our uh, protection of our single-family neighborhoods, a good portion of, uh, of Santa Barbara is in what we call the high-fire zone. And we have a map here, if you turn... To uh, and I think you, most of you have seen this 76. map. Yeah, seventy six. You know all these areas uh, that are in this beige color. Basically, all the Riviera, a good portion of um, the Las Positas area, and the top of the Mesa. Um, you know these areas. You are absolutely not allowed to put a second unit in because of the fire restrictions. Okay, so. Um, so this is kind of our starting point. Uh, we have today in place some areas where it's absolutely prohib prohibited because of safety issues, and then we have high standards to meet not that aren't discretionary but are part of uh, standards. And so th that's where we're at today. So we, we, with that in mind, then you look at what it, what's being proposed now. What's the and what's being yeah? Excuse me, John. If this map reflect what you just said, whether we change. The requirements are not. That st holds true. Yeah, okay, that, that doesn't change. Yeah, and of course those areas that aren't, um, you know, that are in white are you know multifamily commercial, so they wouldn't be applicable to this discussion anyway. So, so you turn to page sixty-five and you look at the top, and then you see here. This is what's in in the housing element today. Is this this first uh, two thirds of the page here, and you know we have always. Well, for the last, I think, uh, two reviews of the, the housing element have had this consideration of reviewing second units because a lot of that's the way a lot of communities meet their uh, housing uh, needs for affordable housing are through promoting. And, and, you know, a lot of communities do exactly the opposite of what we do, and they're very aggressive about uh, promoting granny units. And um, so we have this in here. And the state likes to see this, that, you know, we will consider changes. It's not like we're changing it, but we will consider it. So we sort of outline here what are some of the considerations we would have to consider changing it. And then, you know, so then you go look at 5.3.2, and it says change the size limitations, minimum lots, whether they, they're detached or detached, water meters, uh, affordability requirements, uh, tandem parking, you know, so again, I'm, what I'm saying is these are, again, what I would I would characterize as a pretty high bar to meet. So then you look at okay, well, what's being recommended in the new housing element that's any different than what we already have here, and you're just looking at at some of this underlying uh, language here. It says. Uh, I'll just read out H15 here. Second units, single uh, granny units, and single-family areas shall be allowed within certain areas within neighborhood, with neighborhood input. So that's something new, to gauge level of support, but prohibited in high fire hazards. So that's not changing, to the extent allowed by the state laws applicable to second units. So again, you can't make it a discretionary issue here. It has to be uh, meeting certain standards. Second units may be most appropriate within a short walking distance from a, ma uh, from a main transit corridor and bus stop. Again, so encouraging, you know, where we locate them. Uh, if we are going to locate them, hmm, let's think about where the best place. Well, maybe it's in those second, in those areas that are a little bit more towards the urbanized areas where people can walk and they don't necessarily have to put more cars on the street for parking. So then you look at, uh, with that as the, the policy, then w what would be the uh, implementation measures? That again, and it's uh, looking at uh, what would be some potential when we study it again in the future. <laughs> 
to change this. Yeah. <laughs> So you go down here, changing the existing size, then look at FAR. Now, this was a good uh, suggestion that came out of this process was to keep it consistent with uh, what's happening with the MPO. Uh, again, this is uh, the same ones we already have in there, eliminating attached unit requirements, lot size, affordability, da da da, uh, the water meter thing, uh, and then potentially developing an amnesty program for illegal second units, which will comply with code requirements. And, you know, th that one's a whole other kind of hornet's nest, and I, I don't want to get into that right now either. But, again, this is not, not something that we're saying this plan gets adopted and, boom, all these things go into place. You know what I mean? It's like the idea is this generates a process <coughs> where we, uh, you know, take it to each neighborhood that might want to loosen up their standards and get their feedback and then consider these things, you know. And, and again, these are nothing new, and, and they are constrained by state law. So hopefully, yeah. I just wanted to add one point. Why? Why I think in the Plan Santa Barbara process, this has been of particular um, interest. Is um, it was a topic at one of our community workshops, and it was discussed at the time when a delineated moda area was proposed, and so. That's no longer the case, but I think some people's memory of what this plan might do is back to earlier steps where um, there was an idea that um, uh, these types of things would happen, you know, in the Moda area and that it would be, you could have more encouragement in the Moda than, say, other areas of the town. But it's really been pulled back in, in the process to essentially, as John presented, very similar to the current um, housing element, and um, it's not in the phase one in priority implementation as far as I can tell, um, but it is an important element to have in your housing element. Okay. Questions? Yeah, I got, well, I'm a, I, guess that's, I guess this is a question. The, the, the vibe I got of, of most people wasn't uh, as sophisticated as what Ms. Wee said it was more like, I feel like I might lose control of my neighborhood. So, uh, you know, just in broad terms. And um, I do think people need assurance that isn't the case. They moved there for a particular reason, and they don't want to see it drastically change. So how we do that, maybe there's an overall phrase. And I, I, I notice, you know, when for, for those that are who are wary, I can put it that way, when we say something like, as you said, John, uh, we would ask for input. You know, that's like... A red flag for them. They go input. You know, I'm going to say something. They're going to go to hell with it. I want to do this. So, I'm just giving you the worst case scenario here, so that you understand what I think is an obstacle we need to overcome. Wendy, I don't know if you could cover that. Well, I, I think uh, that the ingredient here that is the city needs to be very careful about is that the state is really strongly. Of course, what is the state? What what can the state do any in any way these days, but the state's policy over the last 10 to plus years has been very um, supportive of secondary units, such that they're really trying to shove them down uh, local jurisdictions' throats, and there needs to be some, lang some cover language in there to uh, show that we're, we're not violating state law. Um, so that's just kind of the, 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 the background, really, of, of all these things that even Put the put the words in there. The, the city has been hugely successful at stymieing the state effort right. to encourage secondary units. No, that's a good point. I think it's mm. good that people realize that. I just want them to know legal that secondary their, units. We're on their side and not on Sacramento's side. To right. Bluntly. Right. And 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 I and and I think that the you know the neighborhood input was the it was a paraphrase of of the the way I had phrased it at one point of saying uh, stakeholder input of actually going neighborhood by neighborhood and you know you look at this map and you start you know if you see like well once you just realize that this is probably not going very far uh, this whole uh, granny unit concept is really not not going very far but I appreciate you know if you could so you have to uh, ride that line of not saying you know we hate granny flats uh, and don't and be don't worry, neighbors. Uh, granny flats aren't coming because that's what state law is really trying to. Uh, you know that that would be a, a red flag to state law, I would think. Any other questions? I have a couple. 
Um, John, on page 66, H15.1, the very first bullet item about changing the existing size limitations, that's 10% right now, right, of the primary, um, maximum 10%. How was that range of, of 300 to 700 derived? Do you recall? Um, I can make a comment, I think, on the 300 side. Um, that was, that's lower than they're currently. The minimum now is 420 square feet. Oh, it is? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think the idea here is, is that Really smaller uh, secondary units may be appropriate than somewhere in our zoning ordinance we have this minimum size of 420. Okay. So that's what the lower end right. was a, a concept. Um, I think the idea to have a set range instead of this funny calculation, because we've seen people actually make an addition to their home first. So they can, yes. And so <laughs> then they have the right percentages. And so right. I think the range was just thought to be that is... It's smaller than the accessory dwelling unit, like in R2. We did a new program called an right. accessory dwelling unit, and I think that could be up to, like, is it 1,200 or something? Is that 900? Anyway, this is the idea is that this is pretty much like a one-bedroom studio to one-bedroom size. Okay. So that's thinking instead okay. of the funny calculation of percentages. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question on the fourth bullet item about... Uh, potentially changing the minimum lot size standard. Do you have any idea how that would change, how many, the actual number of lots? Um, yes, we have a map that we prepared during the single family design process okay. that had all the lot sizes in okay. Santa Barbara. And so I have an idea, but it's not here with me. Okay, all right. <laughs> but can there are a offline. number of lots in Santa Barbara that in these yellow areas that are less than... Um, 7,000. 7,000, yes. Okay. So it would certainly introduce more lots becoming available to this program than okay. now. Okay. Yes. Um, I think those are all my questions. I just have one more if I might. Sure, of course, Mr. Hodgkins. Um, maybe this is all moot because from what Mr. White has said, this is all sort of cover anyway in camouflage, but if it's not... Tandem parking to me works about the first three times that you do it, and then after that it's like, oh God, she's got or he's got to move his car again, uh, and you end up leaving it on the street, which is not what neighborhoods want. Um, thoughts, comments on that from anybody? Well, I, I have all kinds of comments, but I think if we're done with questions, why don't we go to public comment on this? Okay. Okay. I'll open this topic to public comment. Please proceed to the lectern, state your name, and state your business. Hi. Uh, Judy Arias. I'm speaking for the Allied Neighborhood Association. They are pro opposed to uh, the broad rezoning of the city into areas where second units are approved. They are also opposed to the reduction of the standards that are currently in place. Uh, Samarkand conducted a survey of their residents, and I believe you have copies of that which showed overwhelming opposition to secondary units. At our meetings, the groups from San Roque, Upper East Side, Hidden Valley, and the Mesa also indicated opposition. And again, the San Marcan survey is an evidence that the residents want to keep their single family zoning intact. And in particular, concern was the parking. Um, the proposed map that you have in front of you was drawn with an extremely broad brush with no regard for the issues that affect the designated areas. It essentially rezones the entire major portion of the single family residence areas in the city into duplexes or granny units if you want to call it. This has a potential for massive impact. I remind you that the city cannot control the number of people who live in a unit where they work, require them to take the bus, or tell them that they can't own a car. Neighborhoods can well be parked up. I happen to have a, room, a rooming house just up the street from me with cars parked 24-7 on the street, and this morning there were four parked there. Regarding Hidden Valley, 
We've talked with the staff and expressed our concerns, particularly regarding Hidden Valley. We have limited access, with Modoc Road being the major source of, of getting out of the valley. We have a very large retirement home with 200 employees located at the far end of the valley. We have high fire hazard, and with the painted cave, and recently in my living there, there have been five times that we have had fires, three times in the creek, once on the hill, and then the painted cave fire, which required us to evacuate. The other possible way out is Veronica Springs Road, which is a substandard road and not suitable for massive evacuation. We have a very large population of single family houses. Our lots are 7,500 square feet, which is among the smallest single family lots in the city zoning. As I say, we currently have access problems and we also have speeding on our streets, which affect the quality of life in our neighborhood. Our single family residential area was not designed to support second homes. There vague, I've been given some vague statements that some areas may not be appropriate to have this happen. And I would much rather see absolutely clear cut areas that are or are not. Because every time you have an area that's vague, you're going to have applications. The neighbors are going to have to spend time coming out discussing it. Staff is going to have to spend time. Uh, the taxpayer money is spent and wasted if it doesn't go through. And at the, if the project is approved, then there's a cost of policing the conditions. In the current economy, staff has made it very clear that enforcement is not being carried out as vigorously as previously because of the economy problems. This map should be removed from the general plan because it will be the basis for application. And it does not reflect the ability of the areas to take on second units or the wishes of the residents. This map will be used as a reference and it will be not valuable. For instance, Looking over in my area, you have uh, secondary granny units in property owned by Valverde, which is under a conditional use permit. And as I was told, they already have grannies in Valverde. You also have granny units allowed for the Clark Estate, which is uh, a landmark. You also have granny units allowed for, and I have to read it, Dana Lane, which is also pending as a landmark. So. Um, the map needs to be revised or taken out, and it does give false information. The um, interesting thing is that one of the proposals is a loan program of low interest ro r um, rates uh, for 15 years or for the life of the loan, which I find fascinating. And in, in the state law, you will find that it gives an administerial approval which may question whether the neighborhoods are going to be involved and have a chance to say something or not. My final concern is that the GPA general plan seems to concentrate on the expansion and literally the invasion into single family neighborhoods. And single family neighborhoods are important to this city. And our streets have become speedways and we need to have enforcement to protect the quality of life in the single family neighborhoods. I think that's everything I've counted, but I would ask you to refer to the state law, which says administrative approval, and also to the loan program. And in case you wonder, I could rent my house out to 15 students with 15 cars, and it would have a severe impact on the neighborhood. Thank you. Mary Louise Days, Chair of the Citizens Planning Association's General Plan Update Committee, and we have long expressed our support for the single family zones and for some concern about uh, whether being proposed. And the following are really my own comments. Uh, I'd like to point out there already are zoning ordinance provisions that recognize state law to handle uh, granny units. Much of this proposal before you would change those uh, existing provisions. Uh, it even inserts the term granny units after second units, and I don't think that's really uh, accurate because the granny units, when were, they were pr first 
uh, enacted were for attached small units for your mother-in-law or your granny or whatever, for, for relatives. It was not intended to be a blatant rental unit. And, and what, what is being proposed here uh, actually says that. It's for rental units. Uh, we feel that the uh, regulations and the general plan should not be changed in a manner to reduce the control that we have in our single-family zones and to encourage apartment construction in single-family residence zones because that's what it seems to do. It's an effort to destroy single-family zones by allowing nearly automatic addition of second rental dwelling units. Um, and as, as I said, they would not all be granny units. Uh, the current regulations are for small attached units and with a required parking space. Um, the lot sizes, um, the, uh, your attachment does set um, uh, a minimum provision of 7,000 square feet, which uh, is a help, but there is uh, a recommendation or, or a, a consideration uh, to change the minimum lot size standards. The lot sizes in my neighborhood are 5,000 square feet or even less where the um, streets have been widened. There's no room for apartments or even for more cars. Um, if this were uh, reduction were applied, there, it would affect congestion, noise, crime, the appearance of neighborhoods. Um, uh, one consideration I had uh, was kind of touched on by the previous speaker. If, they, if these requirements uh, or requests are ministerial, then who would make the decision on a case-by-case -case basis? There's reference in the document for a case-by-case. -case. Who would do that? A, a staff person? Uh, would there be an advertised public hearing in neighborhood with, to, allowing, uh, to allow neighborhood property owner comments? That's not really ministerial. Um, in my opinion, detached units, and there's a recommendation for to allow detached units, would make a lot uh, to family. Uh, there's a reference for having meetings uh, in the neighborhood to discuss this. Um, I think that's, that is an idea, but it's, I think would have to be pointed out, these are different from, from the original granny unit idea. Uh, if state law demands this, then we can adjust the, the uh, results and the provisions uh, to suit the old neighborhoods of Santa Barbara and those with limited access. Uh, they, these, the attachment 3A has recommendations for a, a loan program, um, innovative design solutions, allowing units to be detached, which to me makes it different from a, a granny unit, changing the minimum lot, lot standard, which uh, introduces all of these other um, areas that have small lots, such as parts of San Roque, parts of the uh, Hope Lacumbre area. Um, this map, again, uh, drew the yellow color on just about every single family area in the city. Uh, your policy 5.3 5 5 .3 calls for consistency with the community's housing needs and neighborhood <coughs> preservation goals. Well, what are the neighborhood preservation goals? Uh, allowing tandem parking and easing other parking requirements. Uh, one of your members has, has expressed some concern about that. Um, that, of course, does put the cars out on the street, even, even tandem parking would. And you've attached your 3C, which is the current standards. Um, they call for one covered or uncovered space. It doesn't say off street, and it, it does say that the existing house has to keep its parking. It doesn't mention locally, uh, legally because uh, uh, people will just start parking in their front yards. But you can see that we are very concerned about this, uh, and we see the need for protecting single-family zones to be single-family. Thank you. Thank you. I never saw why 
or how the state could impose on cities and uh, communities uh, extra units on property. Uh, and I would like to know what is the is state law enforcement <coughs> mechanism? Do they come around like little inspectors come around and say, you don't have enough granny units or you have to put a granny unit here or there or any or these exil uh, or second units? I, I don't see quite how that pie in the sky from somebody living in Watts uh, uh, or in some crowded neighborhoods uh, got, uh, in, got on the books, but that can't be helped. Uh, the, uh, so I think, obviously, there are lots of reasons to for people to have granny units, they have family members and others that need to live live next to them. But to open this up to uh, what rental second units is would certainly destroy the single family neighborhood. A be an example of this came up recently. This is 912 West Mission Street. And uh, they were the neighbors were up in arms because the addition, and I forget quite just the lot just fit into the uh, current seven thousand square foot uh, permission, but the proposed structure was not compatible with the neighborhood, or at least the neighbors didn't think so, but it did sort of go through. So it uh, then any uh, plan should consider the uh, la the current the landscape, and since this is we want to retain our urban forest, the saving of the trees on the lot. And finally, I would like to ask, is there been any census of unpermitted second units? Because there must be a lot of them in the town, and has anybody found out how many? Maybe the new census will, uh, if, when those figures are Maybe those figures are available and you could see where people live and whether these units are uh, uh, permitted or not. And the general plan should address the unpermitted usage. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sheila Lodge. Uh, basically, I want to say that I, I share the concerns that have been expressed by uh, Mr. Forrest, uh, Ms. Days, and uh, Ms. Arias, particularly in terms of reducing the size of the lot that a second unit would be allowed on from to less than 7,000 square feet. I also have a question. I have some recollection of a, an ad hoc committee meeting last fall in which it seemed there was agreement that the Upper East Side would be removed from this. Am I misremembering? Probably am. Okay. I believe that's true. Thank you. Okay. Subcommittee members, given the fact that we've restricted ourselves to 15 minutes of discussion, I would like you to be as concise as possible. And if no one wants to... Mr. Well, White, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, my, my position has been on this that... Um, neighborhoods have need to have a strong input on whether or not they wish to have uh, granny flats and uh, the uh, so that's 
the we've got the language in here is is gentle in that area and maybe that could be strengthened a little bit more um, I appreciate that the uh, this is I had uh, overlooked where Ms. Self had been uh, alluding to the loan program and I I s expect that will those days are gone those days are gone uh, and uh, those days will ne ne came, never came and will never come um, so um, I, th I just think we need to get back to the to, to the local control. I think that neighborhoods have have the right and the uh, privilege and need to weigh in on whether they want them or not, and if they don't want them, that they shouldn't have them. And uh, I, the, the, I appreciate that the smaller lot may be something that we could, you know, take off the list. All of this stuff is is is. Uh, Preceded by the by the comment, possible implement a, implementation actions to be considered. So obviously, it's not uh, it it has no teeth in it whatsoever. It's just it is a consideration, and there may be a neighborhood or two that uh, want to have these in, uh, and there would be that opportunity. There could be that opportunity in the future. I don't hold much. Uh, expectation that we're going to see any more granny flats than we already have I think it's just it's a uh, I think that there's a real place for them um, I think they must be compatible and I certainly appreciate the, 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 the concerns that have been raised uh, at the same time I do think that there is uh, a way for a secondary unit to be compatible in a neighborhood and uh, um, but I sure don't want them, uh, want anybody to think that I'm supporting them where people don't want them. Thank you. Mr. Hotchkiss, comments? I concur with Mr. White's remarks about restrictions and local control. I brought up before the, the puzzle, puzzlement with uh, tandem parking and uh, <coughs> asked just the staff that how do we avoid, as uh, I guess Mr. Reyes said, Somebody coming down, look at this map, and going, "Aha! Here, here I want to launch in." I, I really feel that there is some horrible misunderstanding about this whole policy and this whole issue. The map is not a proposal. The map reflects the current ordinance, and right. so if the Upper East wants to be out of the area, um, what the policy would say, which would be a huge red flag to the state, consider amending the secondary dwelling unit to remove neighborhoods when the residents don't want them. Um, and that seems to be what I think you're saying. This policy says if we ever look at changing our ordinance, it doesn't say change, you know, if we ever looked at changing it, we would do it neighborhood by neighborhood to loosen the standards. You could choose never to do this. And what would happen is status quo would remain. But if you would like to have instead a policy that says the Council of the City of Santa Barbara wants to look at tightening the ordinance and removing neighborhoods that are currently allowed to consider this, that's a whole different issue. And this is just getting really confused I, I, I am having a hard time following. I hear what people say they want in response to a proposal that's not being made. Um, so uh, I'm hoping amongst you all that you're clear. So I, I need clarification on what Ms. Council Weiss, Member I, I White think, just said. I, I think the, the point is well taken. And if there is any misunderstanding about, about it, this, the map here shows what the current ordinance allows. And of course, the current the current ordinance, as far as I know, this it shows is areas in single family zones outside of the high fire area. Right, subject to to standards. Right, and now every little bit of this map may not be correct. There may be some things in here that are inadvertently. Like, for example, if within this neighborhood of the um, San Roque, there are lots of five to six thousand. Right. Then it's not allowed on that specific lot. Right. Exactly. Um, so this map is just showing areas that are not in the high fire where it could be allowed subject to the existing subject to ordinance. the ordinance. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So if we were 
Right. And the reason that those areas are being included in here is because this proposal is saying we might, one thing that might be done is to, in some cases to lower the lot size requirements. Right. And if, if the council wants to reduce this list of ideas to be considered to things right. that you feel are, you know, just one or two ideas, that would be fine too. We, we Sure. Yeah. Exactly. But to have a, a policy. That's what the discussion is really yes, about. Yes, really is about. I, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to say that in the big picture, of course, this is a, <laughs> a pretty blatant example of social engineering on Sacramento's part. Uh, they, someone up there decided that uh, they needed to create affordable housing uh, in unaffordable areas. So um, when, I, when I look at the list of suggestions that have been made for changes, I think that's really what the focus is on here. Um, and these would be changes, again, in some yet to be determined manner where a particular neighborhood would express an interest in having a lower standard. And I do have a question for Mr. Wiley. if. If we had a process like that and some na neighborhood in some yet-to-be-determined manner opted for a more flexible set of standards for secondary units, would that open us up to a challenge that would say any single-family neighborhood would have to have the same flexible standard? Possibly. I don't, I don't know that it would quite play out like that. As Ms. Weiss just indicated, part of the concern, and this is probably less so now with what's been happening with the state, is that the state HCD would come down on us for trying to create an ordinance intentionally restrictive, clearly restrictive, um, when that's not what the state law is supposed to do. And conceivably, we could even get a, a lawsuit from a private party over that. And, and so, for example, if we were to call out specific neighborhoods, uh, upper income neighborhoods of the city and say, well, no second units there, and didn't and did it that way, kind of uh, ham-fisted way, if sure. you will, that would open us up to challenge. Sure. So what your question, it was sort of the reverse of exactly. that. Someone wanted that, but then the implication is, well, then the other ones don't. So uh, I guess my answer would be there's probably a way to do that, but a better way to do it to, because the state law does allow you to say, well, but not where there's traffic impacts. Or uh, high fire hazards, the best example, we've, and that's clearly allowed by state law, and we've said from the get-go 25 years ago, we will not have these in the high fire hazard areas. So there, there's a way to get there, I think. We just got to be a little bit uh, more sophisticated about it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. That's something that we would have to discuss in detail. Um, when I look at these suggestions, assuming that it could be done in such a way that if a neighborhood actually, in a yet-to-be-determined manner, came forward and requested more flexible standards, among the, uh, the bullet items there on H15.21 on page 66, um, the first one, changing the, the ex existing size limitations, the percentage to the 300 to 700 square feet seems like a reasonable one to me. Um, and also the uh, third to the last bullet item, allowing one water, gas, and electric meter seems like a re and, and sewer lines seems like a reasonable one if the actual purpose of this thing is to create a secondary dwelling for a relative it seems to me that if, if we also demand that they simultaneously install entirely separate utilities and entirely separate sewer and water, that that's, that is quite a burden on someone who's attempting to provide, for instance, for an elderly relative. Uh, so that's one that I could see uh, being more flexible on. The others I, um, I, I couldn't support. And in particular, the, the parking, I think, is a major issue. I think that uh, a big concern of people whenever they think about secondary units is the example of the places with a, a huge number of illegal second units already. And I'm thinking of places like a lot of the west side where there are cars parked uh, without brake on street after street after street after street, obviously because of illegal secondary units. Um, 
So I, I think that uh, I think we still, no matter what, have to adhere to the standard of a, a necessary prerequisite for providing one of these extra units is that it be parked. Um, because even if it starts out as a true granny unit, if you will, uh, it could over time become something else. And I think we need to make sure, and of course there are grannies that drive, um, we need to make sure that the uh, <laughs> that parking does not become an issue because that is one of the, the biggest impacts on a neighborhood is the inability to park on the street. So um, that would be... Those would be my recommendations, and I would also say to s staff, uh, something that should be looked at, and I don't, maybe you already have, is in the recent fires, were there areas under mandatory evacuation that are not beige on this map? That's something I, th I, I would like to know. The, um, I have a, an email that I, I could send out okay. that the fire department goes through a very formal process to determine a high fire area and it's, it's not entirely just up to us and so I can Fair enough. Um, send that general information that, that um, Joe Poiré has given and then if, if you have more questions on that it's really a technical question sure. for fire. That would be great. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Other comments? Chair. Mr. Chair? Sure. Mr. Um, I, I feel that the tandem parking is something that can work. Um, um, I've, I, so that's something that that I I still feel is a is a reasonable option. Uh, I would ask you uh, um, and to consider the the second bullet as a uh, as another one that would probably fit with your policy construct. It's a it's a uh, I think it's an important one. So uh, oh, I think yes, that's good. But I, I guess I I ignored it because it's not a relaxation, really. Okay, well, it's it's one that it's an important element in my ability to be able to consider it. Absolutely. Is, is so, um, and and I think, and Mr. White, you're pointing out the one about uh, the square footage of the secondary dwelling unit being considered as a part of the total house as right. far as the FAR. Exactly. And I think that's something I assume we would all agree. Absolutely, that's something that should be right okay. part of it. So yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. It just because it wasn't relaxing anything, but right, and. Uh, I think that the, the the amnesty program is something where uh, I think that the the reason that most illegal units are illegal is that they can't meet the standards. And, exactly. Uh, so that um, I don't I don't feel any uh, sense of foreboding that we're going to have a wave of legal units that's going to come out of that. Uh, well, so. I guess. I mean, I, I'm not, yeah. it's, whether it's there or not isn't is, right. is, is, is it's not moot. A, is not a big deal. Right. Agreed. Mr. Chair, I'm going to have to go in just a minute. Right. The evacuation, where evacuations occurred with the fire, not the high fire hazard area. That's different. Right. I understand that, Ms. Arias, and we'll we'll be discussing that more with the fire department. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hotchkiss. Uh, question for staff. Would it be a red flag to say uh, in a bow to the public that we, the intent of our of this plan is to maintain what historically has been the policy in Santa Barbara? Or do you think that would get us in trouble? I do. <laughs> I, I don't really think you need to say it. The, the policy statement is review the secondary ordinance, which, you know, is whatever the existing policy is for consistency with community housing needs and neighborhood preservation goals. So I don't think we really want to mess with that okay. general right. state. I think it kind of covers it. Ms. Weiss, real quick, uh, are you unclear about anything that Mr. White has said? Because he has to leave. And I believe Mr. Hotchkiss does as well. Um, would you want to eliminate more of these bullets? I guess that I just wasn't clear from all of you. I know you like your, you want to keep the FAR one. Yeah, and the tandem parking. And and I probably keep the okay. parking. but the uh, amnesty could go away. The amnesty could go away. Uh, detached unit. No, I like the detached unit. Okay, minimum lot size. That's I, seeming to cause a lot of controversy. Yeah, we could I, take that and that could go away then. Yeah. I'm, Again, when and, then, and if this right. was ever considered right. by a neighborhood in the council, just because the lot size isn't listed here, I mean, it could still come up. Exactly. So. Yeah, 
Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, the only thing I had disagreed with uh, with Mr. White was the tandem parking thing, but since these are just sort of a smorgasbord we got here anyway, I guess you can leave it in and people can use it or not. Okay, that's a mixed bag. <laughs> we'll try I think, it, I think it it's way. good to have a few things listed under this policy that says when and if this is ever considered for revision, these would be the types of things we're looking at. That, right. That's really what the policy says. Right. When and if, and I think that when and if, um, really, you're not clear on how it would come about. Mm -hmm. um, it could come about by initiation by the city council, okay? And then, you know, that would be, the council would know it's a five-vote matter. I think it would be a pretty serious thing if the council wanted to ever initiate looking at changing the zoning ordinance. Um, the other way it could come up is if, and staff wouldn't propose initiating it unless the city council did. Um, another way it could come up is if probably one person in a neighborhood wanted to do it and they found they couldn't do it and they, we were to say to them, well, if you think your neighborhood might be interested, you know, maybe that could get some traction. Um, Maybe a group like the Mesa Architects, who's already an organized community group, someday might put this on a community group discussion or something like that. But it, it, this is not a high-priority promotion item as the city council's policy as I understand it. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Just, yeah, just for clarification, though, but for the time being, we'll leave it as is, and I'll eliminate uh, changing the minimum lot size as well as developing an amnesty program. Those are the two ones that everybody agreed they wanted to Everyone eliminate. agreed that those should go. Yeah. And then I, I seem to also pick up on everybody thought that uh, the next one, the loan program, should go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, just clarifying that. Well, ladies and gentlemen. I think um, I think rather than uh, try to delve into the the next section without Mr. White, I think we'll have to defer that to a future meeting. Anything else? Yes, the um, the next meeting is scheduled for May sixth, um, and on our original um, outline for discussions, it was going to be to look kind of page by page at the main policies, respond to questions such as those from council member self. Yes. But instead, we're going to change the agenda topic. Okay. Based on the uh, city council discussion from April 19th and a desire to have another look at the whole density question and the whole package of these key policies such as the non-residential and um, development and traffic concerns and all of that. So, um, we're expecting that really to probably take up most of that meeting. In the event that that discussion wraps up and there's time and interest, we would then move to this comprehensive review. Okay. Um, and because we kind of switched gears just as of late based on the 19th, um, we have been able to get packets out early. We're going to do what we can to get that package out early. Sure. But what I wanted to let the public and you all know um, you know, we have had this density discussion quite a few times. Right. So the first meeting, some of that package material, I would reference you to look at that material. But um, we are going to provide some background information from um, an economic study that was done, some demographic information from the EIR. So we are going to bring together some more some new material. information because there was a sense on the 19th that people didn't feel we had as much information, so we want to make right. it share a little more with you all. But otherwise, the expectation is on the 6th that you'll be getting back into the discussion of how much, where, and for who, and, yes. and, and all of those key residential um, development density questions. Okay, and very good. That was your understanding as well? That's fine. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weiss. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.